human experience. We've seen much of the same things. We've done a lot of the same things. And hardly anything on the news at this point is a shock to us. We've heard it all before. We've come to accept the world we live in as just the way things will always be. But this video will be an interruption to the modern human experience because it covers something that will soon shape our world. Because it's coming. It's coming. God's two witnesses are about to be given power. Moses parting the Red Sea. We've heard about Samson fighting lions. We've all heard these great Bible stories, right? But one thing that many of us have not heard about are the two witnesses. Why is that? You see, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, it says that right before Jesus returns, God will give power to his two witnesses. And it describes this vision that God gives John about them. John writes about how one day these powerful witnesses will come. And they are not going to just preach the gospel. No, they will be given power that will give evidence to the world that Jesus is king and is coming back. The book of Revelation says that these two great prophets or witnesses will have fire that comes from their mouths. They will have the power to stop the rain and will even be given a miraculous power to even cause plagues to fall upon those who refuse to listen. It says that for three and a half years, they will be doing miracles to basically prove to the world who Jesus is before he returns. Basically, the miraculous story that we all read about in the Bible will one day be visible again right before our very eyes. So what the Bible says about Jesus is extremely powerful, it's exciting, it's so important. The power of God is going to be on the scene, going viral. So why on earth don't we hear many sermons and messages about the two witnesses? It's a powerful thing that's going to happen. <laughs> well, there are a few reasons. The main reason is because there's a lot of debate about who exactly the two witnesses are. You know, we all have opinions about this. I'm sure many of you have seen so many different perspectives. Some believe that the two witnesses will be Enoch and Elijah. Some believe that they might be Moses and Elijah. Some even say that the whole thing is symbolic for the Old and New Testament. So the issue is, we all have opinions on who they might be. We all have these guesses, these theories. And because we haven't been able to pinpoint exactly who they are in the scripture, we don't hear many sermons about them. We don't see many movies about them because no one wants to say or create something that might not be right. So we just stay silent. Well, today, that changes. My friend, if you follow this video from beginning to end, giving it your full attention, I tell you this, by the end of this presentation, you will no longer wonder about who the two witnesses might be, but you will know without any doubt exactly what and who they are. So, I believe the best way to deal with this subject is to take you on a journey. It will be a personal journey, and I'm going to share with you how God has led me on my journey of researching the two witnesses, and I believe that at the end of this, something powerful will happen. So let's start. who taught that the two witnesses might be Enoch and Elijah. And uh, the reason why many of these teachers said that it might be Enoch and Elijah was because, of course, you know, the Bible never specifically gives the names of who the two witnesses will be. And so, you know, they were just making really good guesses that maybe it's Enoch and Elijah. 
and they had a great argument for why it could be Enoch and Elijah. And this was the main argument. This was the, the argument that many of the teachers I've studied presented. You see, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27, it says that everyone at some point is going to die. But the thing is, Enoch and Elijah are two individuals who never died. They were just taken from the earth by God. <laughs> Lucky them, right? <laughs> so the argument is that since we all have to die and they never die, maybe they will have to return to earth at some point as the two witnesses so that they can one day die because, you know, the Bible says that all people will have to eventually die. And so that was the argument. And, you know, it, it, made, it made sense. It, it does make sense. And um, as I began to study more and listen to other perspectives, other viewpoints, uh, this question did come up. Um, does the Bible teach that everyone has to die literally? Because if you do think about it, when Jesus returns, there will be people on earth who are caught up to him, people who never died, but who are just alive to see his return. And they're just going to be caught up to him. And they're going to be given new bodies and they're going to rule with him in the, in the kingdom. And they never died. And so some people say that, hey, well, maybe if, if there are people who are caught up never died, maybe Enoch and Elijah can be caught up without dying. Because the Bible does say that everyone who comes to Christ has already died with him on the cross. It says that everyone who believes in Christ has already literally died with him on the cross. And so since we know that Enoch and Elijah obviously believe in Christ, some say that perhaps they have already died in the same way. Since they have faith in Christ, maybe both of them have died with him on the cross. And so they are clear. They don't have to die. That is the counter argument. And so that raised a few more questions. And it led me to study other perspectives on it as well. You know, to be well-rounded. And I would say that the most common perspective that I came across was the argument for the two witnesses being Moses and Elijah. Now, personally, I always found this to be extremely convincing. And here's why. Here's why. So first, why, why Elijah? Why would they say Elijah is one of the two witnesses? Well, when the two witnesses are given power, the Bible says that they will do miraculous things to prove to the world that Jesus is exactly who he said he is, and that is going to come back. It says that the two witnesses will be able to make fire fall down from the sky. And the interesting thing is, the prophet Elijah did the same thing. When he was here, he also made fire fall down from the sky to show people the reality of God. And so, you know, it makes sense that if the two witnesses are going to be making fire fall down from the sky, perhaps one of them is Elijah. Makes sense, right? The other interesting thing about Elijah, which is really interesting, is what the prophet Malachi says in chapter 4, verse 5. Check this out. See. I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. So here in the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi writes that before the Lord comes, Elijah will come to earth again. I mean, that's, that's kind of convincing, isn't it? Um, so we're going to come back to that. But what about Moses? What about Moses? Why is he a candidate for one of the two witnesses? Well, if the two witnesses are going to be doing miracles and will be given power to send plagues into the world, if there is one guy in the Bible who had something to do with miracles and plagues, it's Moses. You know, when he was trying to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go, Pharaoh wouldn't listen. And after he refused to obey God, plagues were sent into Egypt to punish them. very similar to that is going to happen when the two witnesses are here on the scene. So you can see why there is this great argument for Moses also being one of them. Now, there is something else that is an extremely convincing argument for Moses and Elijah. I think this is actually the most convincing argument for them. So, um, we know how Elijah, he never died. You know, he was just lucky, right? He was on earth and then you know, uh, he was just taken up to another dimension into heaven in a chariot of fire. He never had to see death. God just took him. But Moses, 
he did die. But even though Moses died, apparently something might have happened to his body, and somehow Moses is still alive. Because when Jesus was here almost 2,000 years ago, he ran into Moses and Elijah standing together. So, in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus was walking with Peter, James, and John. And eventually they came to this mountain, and two figures appeared right there before them. And when the followers of Jesus looked at him, Jesus, he changed. His clothes appeared white. His face began to shine like the sun. And then he began speaking with these two individuals who we learn in verse 3 are Moses and Elijah. And the followers of Jesus, they were shocked. I mean, they see Jesus here talking to Moses and Elijah. His, his face has changed. His clothes are different. And then they hear this booming voice come from the sky saying this, This is my son. Listen to him. And after that, they were scared out of their minds. I would have been too. So this is all interesting. Because for some reason, Jesus had this meeting with Elijah and Moses. <laughs> so many believe that this whole scene was a preview of how Moses and Elijah will one day return right before the second coming. And so I would say that, yes, this is extremely convincing. And it's one of the reasons why for years, if anyone asked me who the two witnesses are, I would have responded that you know, there's a high chance that it's either Enoch and Elijah or Moses and Elijah, but it, I'm leaning towards Moses and Elijah. That's just how I would have responded because everything just kind of fit for Moses and Elijah, especially for me. So that's what I would have, that's what I always said. But the only thing is, I was never truly satisfied. I was never satisfied with that response. Because when people would ask, who are the two witnesses? I would always have to say who I thought they might be. Just like most ministers today respond with who they think it might be. And over time, it began to bother me. Because one thing that I have learned is that every question has a concrete answer in the Bible. We just have to discover it. So I began to pray about this. I began to pray that God would make this thing crystal clear. Because I know who everyone says the two witnesses might be. I've researched many of you. I've read about how um, it might be Moses and Elijah or Enoch and Elijah or perhaps even the Old Testament and the New Testament. I looked into all the theories. And even though I looked into all of them and read them in, in detail, I was still left with who they might be and not straight up who the Bible says they are. And so after praying about this, and asking for wisdom and revelation and uh, illumination and inspiration to understand his word, I began to study this encounter Jesus had with Moses and Elijah, and I found something interesting. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 17. So here, it talks about how Jesus met Moses and Elijah, and after that, his followers began to question him, and they asked him about this encounter, and look at how the conversation goes. The disciples asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first. Now this question that they're asking here is referring to how the prophet Malachi said that Elijah will come before the return of Christ. We looked at that and the disciples knew about that. And so they were asking, why do the teachers of the law say Elijah must come first? And look at how Jesus responds. Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. And in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Okay, so basically the disciples, they ask, why does the scripture say that Elijah is going to come before the Lord comes? And Jesus lets them know that Elijah did come, but in the form of of John the Baptist. You see, before Jesus began his ministry, John the Baptist was on the scene preaching about the kingdom of God. And John the Baptist preached with such fire and such intensity that it got him in trouble. And he was killed for his faith. And Jesus here is just letting his followers know that when it says that Elijah is going to come, that it was speaking about how John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah would come first to prepare people for the ministry of Jesus. And this is why 
when John the Baptist was about to be born into the world, an angel said this to his parents. Luke chapter 1, verse 13. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Verse 17. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. <laughs> wow. Now, look at that verse and compare it to what it said in Malachi chapter 4. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. So just as it says here that Elijah will come, he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and children to their parents. Here in Luke, the angel tells John's parents, oh, by the way, this kid you're having, John, he's going to have the spirit of Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. It's referring to the same thing. And so now we see why Jesus said that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of the prophecy about Elijah coming back into the world. So this is a great discovery, great discovery. But now it leaves us with more questions. <laughs> because this whole thing in Malachi about Elijah coming was a huge piece of why Elijah might be one of the two witnesses, right? It says he's going to return. It says he's going to come. But now it's like you have to start at square one again because we see that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Elijah coming. <laughs> so how do we get down to the bottom of who the two witnesses are? Well, this is where the journey begins. Because now with all of this that we have just looked over, we are ready to look at what the book of Revelation says about the two witnesses with an open mind and objectively. And God is going to open this thing up like never before to reveal exactly who they are. Pray for wisdom, pray for insight and revelation, and let's go through this right here together. I think the best way to start is just to start looking at what the book of Revelation says regarding the two witnesses. We know that in chapter 11, John is speaking with an angelic being, right? He's receiving another vision regarding the end times. And the book of Revelation is full of these visions, okay? We know that he's seen the beast, and that was interpreted by the angel as representing this this uh, this wicked king who would arise. We saw that John saw a vision of a woman who was clothed in the sky and she gave birth to a son. So he saw many visions. He saw a vision of Babylon, the great prostitute. He saw visions and then the angel would always follow up with the interpretation of what the symbols in the vision meant. Now the only thing that's interesting about these two witnesses vision is that the angel doesn't really go into detail to let John know what the two witnesses represent. He has this vision of these two witnesses, these two prophets, these two bold entities proclaiming God's word to the world. And then that's basically all we're left with. The angel doesn't really break down what the two witnesses represent. So we're kind of left to do a lot of the detective work with the help of the Holy Spirit ourselves. And thankfully, we have a few key words here that help us do some of that detective work. So, we see here that the angel is talking to John, and he's uh, really speaking with the voice of God, and says, I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days. We know this is referring to the three and a half year point um, at the beginning, before the Antichrist starts to enforce his evil hand. And it says that they will be clothed, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have the power to turn waters to blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. So, uh, you can read the rest on your own time, but basically, I just want to go over some of this right here. It says, I will appoint my two witnesses. <laughs> And then the angel does give us a clue as to the identity of the two witnesses. The angel says, or you can say the voice of God says, they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, when you are imagining John receiving this revelation, 
What comes to mind when you hear two witnesses? Maybe two people, maybe two individuals, maybe two prophets. And since we weren't there, we didn't personally see what John saw. And since the angel doesn't really go into too much detail about the identity of these two prophets, these two witnesses, it's hard to imagine anything other than just two individuals. And it says that once the two witnesses have finished their testimony, it says, once they have finished their testimony, it says that the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them, overpower them, and kill them. And it says that their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. For three and a half days, people will see their bodies and will gaze on their bodies and even refuse them burial. But after three and a half days, they stood on their feet, and then they went up to heaven. And they heard the voice say, come up here. And that is all that we are given about the two witnesses. So, yes, um, it could, some say that perhaps the two witnesses represent two multiple bodies of people because it says that their bodies will lie in the public square. That could be two bodies or it could be many bodies, right? Um, so, when it says two witnesses, how are we going to find out who they are, what they are? How are we going to get down to the bottom of it? Because the angel, you know, the angel, he broke down what the beast represented. You know, if, if the angel had never explained what the beast or the dragon represented, many of us would still be thinking that one day a giant dragon with multiple heads is going to come out of the earth and then there's going to be this beast arising out of the sea. A lot of us would think that's actually going to look just like that. But thankfully, the angel interpreted it and allowed us to know that this beast and the dragon represented a kingdom. So if you want to know what the two witnesses represent, we have to do what? Detective work. We have to look at the key words that the angel has given us. Now, let me just say this. Let me say this. If the angel, when the angel was speaking to John about the coming beast, the future Antichrist, if the angel had never given John the interpretation, how would we have been able to find it? How would we have been able to find out that maybe this beast represents a king or a kingdom? by looking at the key words. We would have saw the word beast, okay? And then we would have looked throughout the scripture about whenever a prophet was referring to beasts and how it was interpreted in the past. We saw in the book of Daniel how he saw beasts. And what do those beasts represent? Kingdoms, kings. And so even if John had not been given the interpretation of the vision in detail in Revelation, we could have done detective work to discover that the beast represented a kingdom or a king just by looking at how the symbol of beast was used in other parts of the Bible. The same thing can be done here. Even though we aren't given the two witnesses' interpretation in detail, which has left us to have all these different speculations as to what they are, we can do detective work. And the key is in verse 4. He says exactly what the two witnesses are. He just lets you know. He says, they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Hmm. So if we want to discover who the two witnesses are, and what they are. What we have to do is discover what and who the two olive trees are and what the two lampstands are. If we can understand the two olive trees, we can understand who the two witnesses are. If we can understand the two lampstands, then we can understand what the two witnesses are. Because he specifically says, this. by the way, John, this vision that you're seeing about the, these two witnesses, okay, I'll help you out. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. So, he lets us do the detective work. Are you ready to begin? Two olive trees. What does the Bible say about olive trees? What do the other prophets say about olive trees? Well, let's look at what Zechariah says about olive trees. You see, Zechariah was a prophet of the Old Testament, and he was known for receiving many apocalyptic visions from God, and here he's about to get a vision of the end times as well. And he sees, guess what? Guess what? What do you see? And Zechariah answers, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl and at the top seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? And he said, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I don't know. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. And that's all he says. I'm like, come on, can you give us a little bit more than that? But that's all the angel says. The angel says, these two olive trees are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. 
Okay, so that helps us out a little. <laughs> now we know that the two olive trees represent two who are anointed. So they're two either people or two groups of people who are anointed to serve the Lord. <laughs> Man, this is good. All right. We're not done yet. So now we have to discover this. All right. Has an olive tree in the Bible ever been used to refer to just one person? Or does an olive tree find its use throughout the scripture referring to multiple people? Well, let's look at Jeremiah eleven sixteen. Jeremiah, he's calling for the repentance of his people, Israel, the Jewish people. Many have turned away from God. Many have stopped hearing the voice of the prophets. And Jeremiah tries to allow them to see how important they are in God's eyes. He wants them to know how they are important. They are his prized possession. And look what he says to the Jewish people. The Lord called you a thriving olive tree with fruit beautiful in form. But with the roar of a mighty storm, he will set it on fire and its branches will be broken. The Lord Almighty who planted you has decreed disaster for you because the people of both Israel and Judah have done evil and aroused my anger by burning incense to Baal. What did it say in verse 16? The Lord called you a thriving olive tree. Who did he call a thriving olive tree? The Jewish people. Olive tree is not shown to reference one person. It is shown to reference a body of people, a body of many making up a nation. And in this reference, is referring to the Jewish people. And Jeremiah says, because they are turning against God, if they don't repent, he says, what's going to happen? With the roar of a mighty storm, that olive tree will be set on fire and your branches will be broken. My goodness. So the olive tree represents, this olive tree represents the Jewish people. Okay. Is there any reference in the New Testament about an olive tree representing a group of people? Well, we're about to find out. Romans eleven twenty four. 24. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting excited. So, oh my God. So, in Jeremiah, he says that <laughs> the Jewish people, until they repent, what's going to happen? That them, representing an olive tree, will have the branches, their branches broken off. And look at what, what Paul said. You see, Paul was the Romans, and he was talking to Gentiles. I am talking to you, Gentiles. What is a Gentile? Gentile is a person who's just not Jewish, okay? Whether you're Indian, uh, Native American, um, Asian, whatever you may be, if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, okay? So God sees humanity basically in two groups. You got the Jews, and then you have the Gentiles. Everybody else is the Gentiles, and then you have the Jews. And so Paul here is writing this letter to Gentiles, letting us know that because we have come to faith in Jesus, we are included in God's people. We're not Jews by ancestry, perhaps, but because of faith in Christ, we have become God's people. And so Paul here is saying that, yes, the Jewish people are an olive tree. They are an olive tree. But certain branches have been broken off because they did not hear the voice of God and did not believe in the man who was sent, the Christ. And so because of that, God has built up this other olive tree that he's also going to use to serve him. And he says that you, as the Gentiles, are now also part of the olive tree. Let's read. So I'm talking to you Gentiles. And he says, if some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. This is too deep. Remember when Jesus said, when you believe in me and remain in me, you will continue to bear fruit. This is exactly what Paul is referring to here. He's referring to how those who have faith in Christ basically become olive trees. Okay? And he's telling the Gentiles, don't become arrogant. Okay? Just because God has now called you his people doesn't mean he's going to just throw the Jewish people away. Just because you now have faith in Christ and you have now become an olive tree. That does not mean that the olive tree of the Jewish people will be done away with. They are still an olive tree. He's just still working on them. He's not done yet. That's why he says, if some of the branches have been broken off and you, Gentiles, though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others, don't become arrogant. Do not consider yourself superior to those other branches. If you do, remember, you know, it is the root that supports you. So, and so he's playing back to what Jeremiah was saying. Because he was, because Jeremiah said that with a mighty roar, 
uh, the original olive tree, the Jewish people, he said that there's going to be this, these branches broken. And here Paul is talking about what? Broken branches. And again, he's writing to Gentiles and he says, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. And that's true. That's granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. So do not be arrogant, but tremble. So again, Paul is allowing the, the Gentiles, us who aren't Jewish, to know that those who are broken off from the olive tree because of unbelief, you know, don't get arrogant. Just continue to have faith, okay? Just continue to have faith and be grateful, really. But then he's going to show that God is not done with his people of Israel. Look what it says. This is deep. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Wow. Here Paul says that the Jewish people, the moment they, the moment one of his covenant people, descendants of Israel, once one of them comes to faith in Christ, they can be grafted back into the olive tree. They can once again become an olive tree. Gentiles, through faith, we have been able to come an olive tree. And he says that once they come to faith, then, hey, you're coming back into your home. But now it rests upon not how many rules you can follow in the Old Testament, but it's about if you can have faith in God's beloved son, Jesus. So God is able to graft them in again. And then this is it. After all, if you, Gentiles, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Get the picture. We have become an olive tree, grafted into this great olive tree. He says the moment the Jewish people come to Christ, these natural people, the natural they will be grafted into their own olive tree. So, oh my goodness. As believers in faith, we who aren't Jewish by ancestry, we have become a part of this olive tree. The moment God's Jewish people come to faith, they will become what? Their own olive tree. How many olive trees is there? Two olive. This is why Zechariah said, these two olive trees, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Not just Jews, not just Gentiles, but Jews and Gentiles, grafted into one olive tree, but both still separate, serving God. And this is why Paul said, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. You see, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. My friends, Paul just prophesied. He says, yes, there has been this falling away, this unbelief in Jesus. But once the full number of Gentiles has come to faith, those who aren't Jewish, then something will happen. And the Jewish people, the, the people of Israel, will somehow come to faith in Christ. Now, of course, not everyone's going to come to faith in Christ, but a large number will. And once that happens, like we just looked at, once that happens, they will be grafted into what? Their own olive tree. So let's go back to Revelation. Who are? The two witnesses that will prophesy for three and a half years with the Holy Spirit power. Who are they? Did it say that they were two people? Did it say that it was just two individuals? No. It said that they are the two olive trees. You see, when the day comes for God to pour out his Holy Spirit. Now, his, his Spirit is already here. It's already within his people. But when the power comes, that's going to only be unleashed when both his olive trees are ready for service. And that can only happen when you have two olive trees. We got a great olive tree right now, but we're still waiting for the repentance of his people of Israel. Once they come to faith in the understanding of the Messiah Jesus, you have two olive trees ready for service, 
built up, ready to operate in Holy Spirit power, and they will be appointed, and the testimony of two witnesses shall begin. Now, I've said a lot. I've said a lot, man. I've said a lot. And I'll say this. Okay, I'll say this. There's a lot more we have to uncover here. It says the two witnesses are not only the two olive trees, but also are the two lampstands. Okay, so where are the two lampstands? Well, we got to break that down. Okay, and then it says the two witnesses, that there's going to be fire coming out of their mouths. It says that uh, they have the power to shut the heavens. Are we as believers going to have that kind of power? This is something we're going to have to explore. Are we going to be turning the water into blood? This is going to be something that's going to get deep. And also, what about this language that says they will be dead for three and a half days? How can multiple people be dead for three and a half days? Well, we're going to have to break that down. There's an answer for that too. And it says they will be wearing sackcloth. What does that refer to? What does it mean when it says their bodies will not be buried? We're going to have to answer that too. So this is, this is going to be deep. But what I've done so far is allowed you to basically just see that the two witnesses were with a vision that John was given. And he saw not just two people, but two nations. Look what Jesus said. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. Who did he say was to be his witnesses? His people. And they will receive power. You see, God released the power of his spirit powerfully in the book of Acts. The apostles and the, uh, the men and women of God were able to do amazing things. The dead were being raised, the lame were being healed, limbs were being restored, eyes were being opened. When it's time for the witnesses of God to stand up like this again, his power is going to be so strong that it will have no choice but to go viral. And the world will see that God is God. Okay, now we're going to look at another piece of this puzzle. I know it's been a lot to take in. And so, if, you know, if you need to take a breather, you know, go for it. If you need to take a little break, I understand that. But um, jump back into it because, because we are now about to get deep, okay? So, we have seen that the two witnesses are the two olive trees. And God has allowed us to see that the olive trees represent his people, both Jews and Gentiles. And in Revelation 11, verse 4, it says that the two witnesses are not only the two olive trees, but it says that they are also the two lampstands. And so we must remember that this entire thing is a vision that John received. To understand the vision, we have to investigate each symbol and how it is used throughout the Bible. Now, we wouldn't have to do that if the angel had interpreted this two witnesses vision the same way he interpreted the vision of the beast or the mystery Babylon. You know, God wants us to work for it, and that's okay. He wants us to do some, some Bible study. So how are we going to determine what the two lampstands are? Well, this time we actually don't have to journey too far in the Bible. Because in the beginning of Revelation, John has a different vision that involves lampstands. And in that vision, the angel interprets exactly what lampstands represent. <laughs> so that helps us out. Because if we look at how he interprets lampstands and what they represent in that vision, then we will come to understand what lampstands represent in biblical visions. So, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, John sees a vision of the glorified Christ. And he also sees seven golden lampstands. As it reads, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in verse 20, John receives an interpretation of what the symbols mean. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand 
and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So you see, the book of Revelation is all about symbols. And from this one passage, we learn that stars and visions are often a symbol for the angels. And we also clearly see here that lampstands are a symbol for what? Churches. And what is a church? Is a church a single person? No, no. Is it a single entity? By no means. A church is a body. It's always been a group of believers, a body of believers, many people. And so in Revelation 11, 4, when it says that the two witnesses are the two lampstands, it is saying that the two witnesses are what? Two churches or the two bodies of believers. The two witnesses are the two olive trees. They are the who? The Jewish and the Gentile believers. The two olive trees. And they are what? The two churches. The two bodies of believers. The same thing. Just as we saw with the two olive trees, Jewish and Gentile believers. It's mind-blowing. And it's so clear. The two witnesses are God's people. The olive trees, the Jews and Gentiles. And in the same way, they are the lampstands because they are his church his body of believers, the body of Christ. And understanding that, that we are a lampstand, now you see why Jesus would always make statements like this. Let your light shine. Matthew 5, 16. Or how about this? Luke 12, 35. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning. You see, everything is just starting to come together. Jesus was referring to his people as lamps and lights since the very beginning. And he also referred to us as trees bearing fruit. It's been there the entire time. And so all of this, it's, this, is a, this is a huge game changer. Because, friends, you can now never look at yourself the same again. Because as one of God's olive trees, as one of his lampstands, you, as a believer, are one of his witnesses. Which means, when it says that the two witnesses will be given power to testify about Christ for three and a half years in a supernatural way, we now see that God's power will not just fall upon two people, it will fall upon us all. So this changes everything. Because yes, the Holy Spirit is here now, and his power is active now. But for three and a half years, it is going to be present in a way that will silence all debates. So you may wonder, are we that generation? Are we the generation who will receive this power? <laughs> well, it depends. It depends. Whatever generation of people are the last believers who will be here during the final years before Christ returns, that last generation is going to experience the power of God like we haven't seen since the book of Acts. For three and a half years, they will be testifying, proving to the world just how powerful God is. <laughs> Check this out. Um, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, if you look at the King James version of it, look at how it reads. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. They will be given power. And also in the book of Acts, it shows how the first Christians were given a taste of what will happen with the last Christians. Look at what it says will happen in the end times. Acts 2, 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. On my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Verse 19, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon will turn to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Wow. 
It describes exactly what Revelation says the two witnesses will be doing. It's clear. Before Jesus returns, the world will see his power through his people. Hmm. And so it says in Revelation 11, 5, if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this. So, um, it says that fire will be coming from their mouth. Now, we know this entire vision is full of symbols. So, is fire literally going to be coming from the mouths of believers? Or is this right here another symbol? Well, throughout scripture, you will find that fire coming from someone's mouth is sometimes used as a symbol for proclaiming God's word. An example of this is in Jeremiah 5, 14. Therefore, this is what the Lord God Almighty says. Because the people have spoken these words, I will make my words in your mouth a fire. And these people, the wood it consumes. Now, no one was literally burned up by fire coming from someone's mouth, but they were consumed with truth, the truth of God's word. And, and just as it's referring to the word of God consuming people from someone's mouth, it is likely that the same symbolism is used here in verse 5. This last generation of believers will be proclaiming God's word supernaturally in a powerful way that the world just won't be able to avoid. And so it's going to be an exciting time. Verse 6, they have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Man, okay, so let's, let's talk about that one. <laughs> I love it. So these believers, these believers in the future are going to be given power. They will prophesy to the world about the coming of Christ and their prayers will be able to do mighty things. Their prayers will have catastrophic effects. Even plagues will be able to come. So now you see why the world will hate us so much. Now you see. You see, right now, Christians are just kind of a nuisance to the world. We just kind of get on people's nerves. But we're not really a threat. But here... During this time, it says that believers will be operating in a Holy Spirit, supernatural, undeniable power type of way that even though it will be clear that Jesus is real and that he has empowered his people, the world will still not repent. No, they will be angry. They will ball their fists at God before they will repent. And this is why when the Antichrist comes on the scene, the world will quickly join him in his efforts to get rid of us. You see how everything's coming together? Think of it. If you have believers on the same, operating in this undeniable power, I mean, just unstoppable people, the world, as much as we would like that the world would just, you know, love us, they're actually going to criticize us to the point of wanting protection from these so-called believers and the only one who's going to be able to provide it will be who they will consider their true Messiah, the Antichrist. He's going to come on the scene, and that's why he's going to persecute Christians. That's why the world is going to join him to do it, because they have had enough of these wacky believers and their powerful doings. Oh, my gosh. We're on the brink of it all. As it says in verse 7, Now when they have finished their testimony, then... Now, how long was their testimony for? Three and a half years. So it says, after they have finished their testimony, then the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them, overpower, and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was also crucified. And for three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. So it clearly shows here that the beast, the Antichrist, will come up or rise up from the abyss and will attack and overpower and kill, you know, the people of God. We know he's going to try to persecute the people of God, the, the witnesses of God. Verse 9, for three and a half days, you know, their bodies, the world is going to hate, is going to hate them so much 
they won't even bury their bodies. So, I mean, this, there's going to be a lot of hatred going on, and we, we can understand kind of why now understanding what's going to be happening leading up to it. Now, in verses 9 through 11, we have more symbolism, a big piece of symbolism, including something that we have seen with other biblical visions, day-to-year prophecy. You see, when you study prophecy, especially the prophecies of Daniel, we have seen how often days can represent years. We saw this with the 70 weeks of Daniel. We saw how the number of days mentioned in that prophecy represented the number of years it would be until Jesus was on the scene beginning his ministry. We saw how in the Jonah prophecy, there was the day to year symbolism, which foretold the exact year that Jerusalem would fall. So if you haven't seen those episodes, you know, you're gonna wanna watch those, it's great. And so there are many references in scripture to how days in prophecy are symbolic of the number of years something will happen. Uh, we even see a reference to this in Ezekiel 4 verse 6. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. So again, with prophecy, days can refer to the number of years something will happen. And since this here is a prophetic vision with symbols, when it says three and a half days, it is not far-fetched to understand here that we have another day to year prophecy, which fits perfectly within the seven-year period before Christ returns. Some refer to it as the seven-year tribulation. Really, it's going to be three and a half years of tribulation, but the seven-year period before his returns shows how this is another day to year prophecy. Let's take a look at this. So this all takes place during the final seven years before Christ returns. If you haven't seen our video on the tribulation, see that, and then be sure to see the Antichrist episode, and it breaks down the seven-year period before Christ returns. Now, I know many of you are wondering how the rapture fits in all of this. Well, as we saw in the previous videos, you have believers who are pre-tribulation believers, and then you have are those who are post-tribulation believers. Those who are pre-trib generally believe that the rapture will happen at the start of the seven-year period. Those who believe in the post-tribulation rapture believe that it happens at the end, right before the second coming. So yes, you know, there's a lot of division on those two perspectives, and in the future we will address that in a video specifically for it. But one thing I will say that we can all agree on is that there will be believers who are here during the tribulation. Christians. Because they're going to be persecuted, you know, by the Antichrist. We know that. But now we know that during the start of it, the believers who are here will operate in not fear, but power. During the first half of it, God will give his people the ability to represent him in a supernatural way for three and a half years. They will perform miracles, they will do mighty feats, and they will prophesy. But at the middle point, the Antichrist will rise to power and will begin to persecute God's people. And this vision says that their bodies will lie in the streets for three and a half days. But understanding that this is another day to your prophecy, we see clearly now how the people of God won't just be persecuted for three and a half days, but during the final three and a half years. And that is why it says that during this last half of it, for three and a half years, their bodies will not even be buried. Because the Antichrist will persecute believers, and the world will hate them so much they wouldn't even want them buried. Now, <laughs> what happens at the end of the three and a half year period? The second coming of Christ. When he returns, and all of his people, those who have died and those who have survived and those who were persecuted for him, all of his people will be raised and caught up to meet him in the clouds. And that's why in verse 11 it says, but after three and a half days or three and a half years, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. So, 
it's clear. After three and a half years of persecution, his people will finally receive justice. They will be caught up to him and the millennial reign of his kingdom on the earth will begin. Now, there's still more to explore because in verse eight, it says that their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So we know that this is a vision. There are many symbols. And it says here, they will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. So we know that this, there's going to be some symbolism going on here. So the question is, what is the great city? What does that represent? Well, thankfully, the angel actually interprets what that represents in a separate vision. In Revelation 17, verse 18, look at what the angel says. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And in chapter 17, we learn that this woman is a symbol representing Babylon the Great. So when it says that their bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, it's referring to how the people of God, their bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, Babylon the Great, which is the city that will be linked to the empire of the Antichrist. The thing is, we learn from the book of Daniel, from his fourth beast, that the empire, the kingdom of the Antichrist, will have a global jurisdiction. So if that is the case, those streets, the streets of Babylon, the streets of the great city, will be not just in one place, but everywhere. And so we will have a future video on that when we address the topic of Babylon the Great. And as always, I love to hear your insights. We love to hear your insights. So share in the comments, you know, what you think about Babylon the Great. What has God shown you through your studies? Because this is a great platform where we can learn from each other and share these ideas. In fact, one commenter recently shared something with me about the two witnesses that I had never considered before, right before um, I, I was beginning this presentation. And so I want to share that with you because it's quite amazing. So check this out. In the book of Revelation, chapter 17, John is seeing another vision. This time he's seeing a vision of Babylon the Great. And look at what it says in verse 6. She was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. I had always read this and didn't really think that much about it until a commenter pointed out that the word used here for martyr is actually translated from something else. If you click here where it says tools, you'll see that the word used for uh, martyr, martos, is actually the word witnesses. If you look at the Greek word martos, the actual definition and primary meaning and usage of the word martos, which was translated into martyr, is actually the word witness a witness. In the King James Version, that same word is used to refer to witness 20 to 29 times. It's only used as martyr three times, so the primary use of the word is witness. So really, the most accurate translation would have been, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, which is amazing, which is further evidence that the two witnesses who were persecuted by the Antichrist, who were persecuted by Babylon the Great, are not just two people, but are the collective people of God. The blood of the witnesses. Wow. So, before we wrap this up, there is one more symbol that we have to unpack. Revelation 11, 3. So it says, I will appoint my two witnesses. Want to know they a little secret? If you smash the like button, subscribe, click the notification bell, you'll have superpowers for the rest of your life. So what are you waiting for? Time to fly. You want to know a little secret? If you smash the like button, subscribe, click the notification bell, you'll have superpowers for the rest of your life. So what are you waiting for? Time to fly.